Christine Hi. is here. Chris, <laughs> nice to see you guys. Debbie, Barbara. Hey, Chris. All right. Okay, so we are actually live on Facebook now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And I'm going to go ahead and officially get started with our program. So welcome, everybody. My name is Carol Bailey White, and I'm the president of Duval Audubon Society. I'm pretty sure everybody here knows that. Um, but just to be official about things, uh, as always, we do ask everyone to please keep your audio on mute uh, while the presentation is going on. If you have any questions for the speaker, uh, just please post them in the chat window for um, the Q&A session uh, after the presentation. Um, our speaker tonight is Chris Farrell from Audubon, Florida, and I will introduce him uh, in just a moment. Uh, but just a little bit about our chapter, uh, and everybody pretty much probably knows all this as well. So um, I'll, I'll give you a minute to read over this. Uh, our main focus for our chapter is to connect people with nature. And so everything that we do, uh, we try to um, achieve that goal in any way that we possibly can and that we can think of. So any way that's feasible for us. Um, that's what we really want to do. Our, our, our idea is you, you have to let people connect with nature so they'll care about it and then they will do things to help protect it. So that's kind of our focus. Um, all right, so I did want to mention that um, we had at last our last meeting our, at our March meeting, we had announced that we were accepting nominations for uh, our board of directors for 2021 2022. Um, we have not received yet any nominations. I welcome them still. Uh, for our open positions. Um, but since we haven't received any nominations, there's no, there's no real need to uh, hold an actual uh, election. Uh, all of the people mentioned uh, uh, on this slide uh, have agreed to or desire to stay on next year for um, the 2021-2022 uh, season. So thanks to all of our wonderful board members for everything that you guys are always doing to help support our activities. We cannot run this chapter without you. <laughs> uh, and so, and it is also National Volunteer Week. And of course, all of our board members are volunteers. Uh, so uh, a special thanks to, to everyone for, for just being willing to pitch in and, and help run this chapter. Um, we do have a couple of open positions that are particularly critical. Uh, we would excuse me, um, we will have a, an edu our education director position. We it will be open next year. So we'll be looking for somebody to help us with educational outreach. Um, we are also still looking for someone to help us with field trips and programs. And that could potentially be split into two different people. Um, we could have one person focusing on managing our field trips and another post person managing our program. So uh, don't feel um, overwhelmed with the potential for that uh, being a large responsibility. Deb Kanaskas is on the call and she used to do both of them. And I guarantee you, she knows exactly what's involved in, um, uh, in both of those uh, functions. And it is quite a bit of work. So um, <clears throat> if somebody just wanted to handle field trips, we would love that. That would be awesome. <laughs> if anybody has any questions about anything regarding uh, the board or management of our chapter, please just reach out to me at duvalaudubon at gmail.com. I'll be happy to help. All righty. So I did want to mention some of our upcoming events. We are, our season, of course, does end at the end of May. So um, this is pretty much not quite everything that's going on through the end of May, but almost. Um, this Friday, April 23rd at 8.30 a.m., we have had to reschedule our um, cleanup that was um, supposed to be yesterday, but um, at Heritage River Road Wetlands, but uh, the rain uh, totally washed us out. And so we rescheduled it to this Friday. So if you haven't signed up for that, uh, please go to our website. We would love some help. And it's a nice thing to do for Earth Day. So uh, please help out with that if you can. Uh, Saturday, we are having our open house at Crosby Sanctuary. This is something we've been doing monthly since 
I think it's been since September, since basically the beginning of the season. And they have been just fabulously well attended. Everyone seems to enjoy basically just getting out there and getting some nature therapy on their own. So it's always, um, it's always a, a nice event. I really enjoy um, um, participating in that myself. On Sunday, we're having our next forest bathing meditation session at Crosby Sanctuary. Keep your fingers crossed for good weather. Um, that one does need to be, um, you, if you're interested in doing that, you will need to sign up on our meetup site and you can get to that um, through our website here, www.duvalaudubon.org, just by looking at the um, uh, calendar of events and it'll take you there. Uh, we are having our field trip uh, at the St. Augustine Road Fish Management Area that was supposed to happen last Sunday on April 11th, but that one also got rained out with something about Sundays. I'm a little bit worried about anything we are <laughs> scheduling for Sundays. Um, but um, May 2nd uh, at 8.30 a.m., um, St. Augustine Road Fish Management Area field trip. So we're looking forward to that one. Uh, and then we are having our Crosby Sanctuary Nature Walk and Work Day on May 15th, just it's our monthly every third Saturday of the month. And on May 16th, uh, we're having a field trip at Kingsley Plantation. So these are, we're just slowly easing back into being able to offer regular field trips. Uh, with our field trips, we are uh, still um, limiting attendance and we are obser observing social distancing and asking people to mask up uh, just for safety. Uh, we hope in, in the fall, we won't have to do that anymore, but we'll have to just see how it goes. Um, and our next monthly program, May 17th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Uh, is gonna be uh, Introduction to Ethical Investing. So we have a certified financial planner, um, Joe Trainer, uh, who works with Ameriprise Financial uh, and he's basically going to go through a basic introduction to sustainable investing, uh, investing with a heart. Uh, and that might, that, that's, that's a very interesting subject to me, um, you know, to put your money where, uh, to things that you care about. So um, that might be a very interesting program. And as I've already said, all of our calendar of events, uh, all of our events are on our calendar at DuvalAudubon.org. Um, and so let me now... Uh, check the chat. Okay, and also, so Kate uh, Hurlbut of the Ixia chapter of the um, Florida Native Plant Society reminded me that on um, uh, Saturday, April 24th, they are having their Native Plant and sixth annual Native Plant Sale. And I think she put that in the chat just to me, Kate, or to everybody? Well, I guess you probably can't send it to everybody. Let me try, let me copy and paste and send it to everybody. You may not be able to do that. Hang on. And I'll just share this with everyone. Okay, so there's all the information on the native plant sale. And let's see if there's anything else in the chat. All righty, perfect. Okay, so without further ado, let me stop my share and I am going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. And that is, of course, Chris Farrell from um, Audubon, Florida. Um, so here's our introduction of Chris's program, uh, A Turn for the Better. Um, Northeast Florida is home to some very special shorebird nesting sites, as probably you all know. Few places in Florida rival the Royal Turn Nesting Colony at Huguenot Memorial Park or the lease turns of Anastasia State Park in St. Augustine. So Chris Farrell, Policy Associate for Audubon, Florida, will share information on the beautiful shorebirds that nest in Northeast Florida and what is being done to strengthen their populations. Um, a little bit about Chris. Uh, he, uh, again, is employed by Audubon, Florida to help promote conservation and related environmental issues in our Northeast Florida area. Uh, he's also been active in the St. John's County Audubon chapter uh, and has written several articles that have been published uh, and featured on the Aud Florida Audubon website. Chris lives in St. Augustine and Chris, thank you so very much for joining us tonight and I believe you are already sharing your screen. So thank you and I will uh, pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Quick technology check. Can, can you hear me most importantly? 
Okay. <clears throat> um, can you see my presentation? Second thing. <clears throat> All right, two for two. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Chris Farrell. I work for Audubon, Florida. I've worked uh, for a total little over 12 years for Audubon. I did six years down in, in the Everglades on their ecosystem restoration campaign. Uh, and then a little over six years now uh, up here in Northeast Florida. I will just preface before we get into any detailed questions about birds later on. I am not an ornithologist. Uh, I'm, I'm more of an ecosystem level uh, community ecologist. I, I worked with reptiles and amphibians uh, at the, in grad school. And um, so herpetology has always been uh, one of my favorite subjects. I love spiders. I love everything. So I know a little bit about a lot of things. I've, you know, you work for Audubon for a while and you, and you learn about birds, but um, uh, <clears throat> we'll see. Don't, don't treat me too roughly with questions at the end. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, <clears throat> tonight, we're going to talk about shorebirds. Uh, and again, bef even before the, the talk tonight, a few of us were talking about birds and how to tell them apart. The good news is I work with our nesting shorebirds in Northeast Florida, so I only have to know like five or six species. I know those species really well. Uh, we'll, we'll do a little overview of, of different species that use our beaches here in Northeast Florida, and then we'll focus on the ones that are nesting and raising families. Uh-oh. Click. Where do I click? Let's try clicking over there. No. There we go. Okay. So North, Northeast Florida, we, we have a lot of... Uh, Shorebirds. Uh, we have well, we have many, many birds. First, start with how many different species use Northeast Florida? Over 300 is a pretty safe number. If you put together like all the eBird list, uh, you know, 350, 380. You know, you can come up with close to 400 bird species that have been spotted in the area. Um, so it's a it's a really amazing place uh, to go birding. The coastline has a lot of unique features, different habitats. You know, there's all the beach and the, the intertidal habitats, plus the maritime hammocks. We've got barrier islands. Um, pretty soon those will go into pinelands, uh, you know, all within a relatively uh, short distance from the coast. So this really interesting uh, diversity and mosaic of habitats uh, gives us diversity that, that allows us to have all these cool species. Just a Quick side note, I'll try not to do too many of these. Got a bunch of slides to go through. Um, I was stopping to get snow cones the other day with my kids in St. Augustine, and there's a food truck at, at uh, some little marina right on the Matanzas River. And in 10 minutes of standing there, I saw over 20 different species of birds. Clapper rails flew out of the marsh. There's all sorts of hawks and Osprey uh, flying around, some swallows in the distance, the, you know, the egrets, the least turns, it was just, uh, it was amazing, you know, you get, you get like 20 species in five minutes. Uh, but it was because it was this really interesting, you know, salt marsh with uh, forest around it. You, you get a diversity of habitats and you can get a lot of species in one place. And, uh, you know, the quick ecology lesson, if, uh, you know, we have all these different resources that the birds can take advantage of. Um, so this is, you know, from a, a textbook, but it's a really good picture showing how the different species, uh, you know, we can have so many different species because they're taking advantage of different parts of our resources that are available to them. Uh, the different lengths of neck help birds feed the different lengths of their bill. Uh, you see ducks here, you know, diving down to get the vegetation that's at the bottom, you know, skimmer flying across the surface. Uh, even birds that fish, they use different size fish and they have different strategies for getting those fish. Um, so it's a really, you know, cool thing to think about and you can pay attention when you're at the beach looking at all the beautiful birds. You can also think, you know, why is its bill shaped like that? Why is it that length? And, and you can see how, how their bodies um, are, you know, helping them take advantage of the resources around them in particular ways. Uh, okay, a few photos. 
uh, to look at some of the, the non-breeding species that we get to see. This is a black-bellied plover. It's a really nice bird because its name is a black-bellied plover and it has a black belly. So that's good. Helps us identify. Of course, it is one of the shorebirds that loses all those features in the winter and we can never tell them apart. But. Semi-palmated plovers, another common species you'll see in 20s or 30s in large numbers um, on our beaches here in Northeast Florida. Nice striking colors. Yellow legs, one of the, the annoying species like dowichers where there's like different versions of them that we have to keep track of. Uh, this is a greater yellow legs uh, as compared to the lesser. Um, most of these photos here at the beginning, just pointing out uh, Emily Carter Mitchell, uh, somebody who was passing through St. John's, I got in touch with. She took a bunch of pictures at Fort Matanzas and, and allowed me to use them. So this is my call out to all the photographers that might be watching. Please send me your photos. Um, uh, a fair number of these, you know, if you were here a couple of years ago where I talked to shorebirds, you, you might have seen some of these. There's some new photos too, but uh, so so I can have fresh photos to show people all the time. Please send me your photos. We're, we're not only doing advocacy stuff through Audubon, Florida, um, we're reporting uh, on our grants and sending in photos um, and, and we, we make announcements about, you know, it's nesting time and we're doing press releases and we don't want to use the same photos all the time. So uh, I would love it if you could send me and we'll make sure you have all my contact information here at the end we can put it in chat you can always just get a hold of carol or anybody brown pelicans beautiful birds along the beach uh some of these you know it's like you, you see them so commonly and um uh it, you know it's funny rarity can make things special but you know brown pelicans are one of those that no matter how many times you see them flying in formation uh they're, they're pretty majestic uh, here's a turn. What kind of turn is it? We're gonna have to ask Kate to come off mute and identify this turn for us. Um, so this is uh, this is the one. He's he's in flight, so it's a little harder. You can't see. He has he does have kind of rock star, cool feather, uh, spiky feather look. Uh, so royal turn. So uh, in the introduction, Carol mentioned you know, you know royal turns at Huguenot Memorial Park. If you haven't been there, to see the royal turns nesting at Huguenot Memorial Park is something you have to do. Uh, they go out there this summer uh, in a couple months, month, month and a few weeks. Um, but once the chicks have hatched and they're coming off the beach, uh, we'll have a couple pictures later on. But uh, seeing all those thousands, literally thousands of royal terns on the beach in Huguenot, it's a really cool thing. Red knots. Uh, this is not a species that spends a ton of time here, but it spends important time here. Uh, red knots is... Most of you might know there's been a lot of stories, there's been books about them, the book called Moonbird, because, you know, their migration each year, they, they, they fly from basically the top of the earth to the bottom of the earth and back. Um, so they, they go incredible distances and, and Northeast Florida has several places where they stop to forage, um, Fort George, uh, around uh, Huguenot, um, Nassau Sound, um, Fort Matanzas Inlet, and and they they have to get fuel and then get back uh, into the air to continue their journey. So even though they don't spend a lot of time here, it's really important that our resources are in good condition so that they can fuel up uh, and have enough body fat to complete their journey. Here's a, a bunch of birds, all different kinds. Uh, so this is a cool thing to see when you go out to the coast. Uh, and this is a fun game you can play. You know, just take a picture and then go home and see how many different species you can identify in these mixed flocks. Black-necked stilt, they're not super common here, but they're, they're gorgeous birds. If you wanna see them, Spoonbill Pond up by Nassau Sound, um, Little Talbot, Big Talbot area uh, is a good place to see them. Occasionally they nest there. And uh, at the GTM, near the Guanam, Matanzas, Tolomato, I said that in the wrong order, Guano, Tolomato, Matanzas, National Estuarine Research Reserve. Uh, out of the GTM Nur and Guana Lake, uh, I've seen stilts out there too. Y'all probably know, I don't get out birding much. Um, <clears throat> ruddy turnstone, cute little birds, turning over all the shells. 
uh, on the beach. All right, so that's a handful of some of the diversity we have out there, but we're going to focus on the ones that are raising families on our beaches and why being stewards of our beach and protecting our beaches for wildlife is so important. Okay, a lot of people go to the beach and they just see sand, ocean, a few little plants. May, you know, it might not jump out as a super critical area for wildlife, um, but it is indeed that. Uh, this is a picture of the, the beach at Fort Matanzas. Um, but this open sand area with sparse vegetation is critical habitat for several species of colonial nesting birds that we'll look at. The slightly more vegetated areas get some of the shorebirds. So, um, you know, Fort Matanzas Beach will have a couple species. It used to be the largest least tern colony on the Atlantic coast. Tough conditions there and some good conditions elsewhere and moved that title. But um, it's important when we go out and, and see the beaches to realize how many important uh, species are using that habitat. Uh, quick note um, about the Florida Shorebird Alliance. So the good news is today it's it's a lot different than it's been in the past. Um, the last 20 years have seen an incredible growth in the attention and stewarding and uh, overall conservation effort um, done to protect our shorebirds. So I mentioned I, I worked for Audubon in the Everglades uh, a while back. And um, in 2001, I went to Audubon Assembly. We have our annual assembly each year. 2001, I went to, I think it was 2001 or two, uh, I went to the assembly and the Suncoast um, chapter um, down in Sarasota, goodness, I'm getting their exact name. Uh, I got too many names of these partnerships here. Um, uh, but one of our Audubon chapters down in Southwest Florida, they were starting a program to take care of the birds that were nesting on the rooftops there. Shorebirds were nesting on the rooftops and the chicks were falling off. And, you know, that's, it's horrible. You know, we've already, we messed up the beaches enough to where the birds had left the beach and went to the to rooftops. Uh, flat gravel rooftops made in the 80s that looked enough like a beach that the birds started using them. But they were falling off. So they came up with a program to put up fencing and have people check. And if the chick fell off, they created this cute device called a chick -a boom a pole with like a basically could open milk carton and you dump the chick back up on the roof. And, and, and so Audubon worked with FWC to, you know, kind of create this program. And then, uh, you know, they won some, some chapter awards at the assembly and it's this great program. And then other chapters said, hey, we should do that. And uh, by 2006, St. John's, County Audubon started their own, you know, they didn't have, they have some rooftops, not as many, but they, they started working to protect the, the nesting birds out of Fort Matanzas and on the beaches. And so just organically, these efforts of mainly Audubon chapters working with the limited um, Fish and Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, I'm sorry, I said FWC, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, which I will now call FWC the rest of the talk. Um, Audubon was working with FWC and some other local partners, uh, local governments and to conserve shorebirds. And this model just kept replicating. And then eventually we got today where we have the entire coast where we have sandy beaches where birds nest have uh, partnerships. We call them shorebird partnerships. And, and we formed this, this master organization, the Florida Shorebird Alliance to talk about them all as a group. Uh, so this has happened within, you know, 20 years based on some efforts of some, some volunteers in Southwest Florida that really kickstarted this. So it's pretty cool, pretty cool thing. And what do they do? Um, protect and monitor nesting birds in a nutshell. Uh, making sure we know where the birds are at, trying to keep them, we, we call it posted, um, having uh, this symbolic fencing, PVC poles with string and, and flashing and signs to let people know where the birds are at, bird stewards to keep the bird, uh, people away from the birds basically and make sure they're not doing anything harmful. Uh, and so we'll talk about that in detail, but a whole bunch of activities to make sure these shorebirds can be successful out on our beaches. Uh, so 12 partnerships, the only areas we don't work down in the 10,000 islands in the Southwest of Florida, you can see there's no partnership and that's because there's no sand, that's, uh, you know, mangroves. So, uh, all the sandy beach habitats covered 
There's over 30,000 people. You can be one of them that is subscribed to the Rack Line newsletter. Um, if you go to the site, FL Shorebird Alliance, that's the Florida Shorebird Alliance uh, .org, their website, lots of information about shorebirds, about the partnerships, about uh, how to sign up for the Rack Line just to get this monthly newsletter of activities going on with shorebirds around the state that FWC sends out. Uh, lots of great resources, information at that website. All right, so the birds, the stars of the show. Uh, we're going to talk about mainly these five species shown here. The two on the left are shorebirds, technically shorebirds, uh, that are solitary nesters. Uh, shorebirds because they feed along the shore. The three on the right, you could call seabirds. It gets too confusing, so we just call them all shorebirds to make it easy. But um, if you want to be technical, uh, we refer to the three on the right as seabirds. And it, there's some important distinctions. Mainly, they eat, they go forage, they get their food in the sea. So the seabirds on the right, they need to go get fish. The shorebirds on the left, they eat um, all sorts of stuff, uh, especially yummy stuff found in the rack that washes up on the beach, um, but mollusks and worms and sand fleas and things in the in the sand too. Um, and then uh, solitary and colonial. So their nest, the, the colonial ones, obviously big colonies, large, hundreds of them nesting within a relatively small area. And the shorebirds, with that more upright profile, um, they're, they, they're solitary. Sometimes the Wilson's plovers uh, can nest 10 feet apart, 12 feet apart, but they're, they're much more spread out. So all of these birds nest in Northeast Florida. All right, so I mentioned uh, seabirds. They, they go fish out of the sea, get fish out of the sea to eat. Um, shorebirds will eat a, a ton of different things, anything that's along the shore. All right, so we'll go through the species. I'll point out a few of the, the characteristics um, where you can identify them. Uh, but mainly, if, if you go to the beach and they're nesting there, that, that narrows it down to just a handful of species, and then they're pretty easy to tell apart from there. Uh, so this is the least tern. Least, as the name implies, it's the smallest of the terns. Uh, Pretty small. Uh, when you, you see them flying around, they have a very distinctive call that you get used to very quickly. Very angular wings. They they dart around. Uh, they go out to catch fish and they splash down. You know, they kind of hover over an area for a second and then dive straight down to get them. It's pretty impressive to watch. Uh, they have the white triangle on the forehead, a uh, yellow bill, black tip on the bill. This is when they're adults. When they're young, they look a little different. We'll see a picture of in a second. One thing you notice when we see any eggs or young in the uh, slides tonight, they're grayish, brown, speckled. Uh, they're all just trying to blend in with the sand and the shells. So eggs and chicks are pretty defenseless. Their only defense is camouflage and, and not being seen. Um, so a lot of the chicks and the eggs look very similar. And then as they grow, they uh, start to take on the characteristics of the adults. But you can see this, uh, this is a flight capable. Um, judging by its wings, it's developed enough structure in, in its wings that it, it could support flight. Uh, this is a flight capable bird, but the head is very different. The bill's not yellow. Um, so the young do look a bit different than the adults. Um, oh go back one second, uh, threatened. So almost all the birds were working hard to conserve them because they're imperiled. Their uh, future is in jeopardy. Almost all shorebirds, sadly, because of the amount of development that's taken place along our coast. And when I say our, I mean we, the people of Earth, <laughs> you know, everywhere around the, the Earth, the coast has been a desirable place whether it's for reasons like, you know, ports and transportation that have been important throughout history or just people wanting to live there or resources like getting fish and seafood. 
Uh, we've had a lot of development of the coasts, and unfortunately, that's meant a lot of problems for our shorebirds. So uh, the least tern uh, is, is threatened. Uh, the state of Florida has it listed as threatened, which gives it uh, particular protections. They're good because they help us when we do conservation at the beach. Um, so this um, is a little fact sheet. I posted it here. I'll just mention a couple of highlights. They have fact sheets for each of these species at Florida Shorebird Alliance, the flshorebirdalliance.org website. They have fact sheets for each of our species. Uh, FWC made these a, a year or so ago. They're pretty cool. Um, so a lot of information about least turns on here. Uh, some important things that they've learned recently. Uh, we, we've been monitoring for years and trying to monitor thoroughly enough uh, that they could come up with population estimates. If you, you know, you need to gauge the success of your conservation efforts and, and if you're getting the species back to a healthy level, you have to have a, a way of figuring out how many there are. So uh, using 10 years of data and a couple years of working out methods for coming up with these estimates, FWC has, has given the estimate uh, with the data up to 2019 of 7,200 pairs of uh, least terns nesting in Florida. The interesting thing, which is also a challenge for us for future conservation, is that 55% of these birds nest on rooftops. Most of these rooftops were rooftops from the 80s, flat, tar paper, gravel, and we don't do roofs like that any, anymore. So each year in St. John's, St. John's never had a, a ton of rooftops, but we had a handful and we had decent colonies and they'd produce young. But uh, just like the rest of the state, um, the roofs get old, they get redone and the new roofs don't support the birds. So we're down to just um, two, two or three sites that really have a chance of producing any birds in St. John's County. Uh, if this pattern, you know, continues over time where we keep losing rooftops that are good for the birds uh, and replacing them, uh, you know, with other types of structures, you know, what's that going to do to the, the conservation, you know, success that we've seen and, and, you know, half of our work has been putting in conserving these, these birds on rooftops. So, uh, so that's an interesting uh, situation moving forward. Can we can we restore beach habitat? Can we get these birds to move back? Uh, will they move back? A lot of birds are uh, nesting birds in general, but a lot of these shorebirds they have high site fidelity. They'll go back to where they came from to nest. Uh, but the good news is um, that's not incredibly rigid. Uh, and we from banding efforts, we've already seen birds that were born on rooftops using beaches and nesting there later on. So uh, we know they have the capability to move back to the beach. Uh, we just need to make enough beach habitat attractive to them. Uh, so these are the least terns. They're beautiful little birds. They, they're very cute to watch. This is uh, uh, a couple out, out at um, Fort Matanzas, uh, one with a fish in its mouth right now. So where we were a couple of few weeks into April, right now out on our beaches, these least terns are doing these behaviors, running around. Uh, the male will prevent, prevent, will present uh, a fish to the female and, um, you know, run around her and show her this fish, hope, hoping that she accepts it. Um, and you can, you can, this is a fun thing to do right now, just go on the beach and watch this and see how often they're successful and their failure, their failure, it's good. They have very short memories. Um, you know, I've, I've watched them approach a female and, and you know, I'm just imagining in my head what he's, you know, saying to her and how she's the only one for him and, you know, his whole life and he's waited for a bird like her and their soulmates and, you know, and then she just turns around and ignores him. And then you see the bird sit there for a second, look around, find another female, run up to her, offer the fish and start over. So. Uh, it's it's kind of cute. Uh, if it's successful, uh, did we give a mature audience's warning for this talk? Um, if she takes the fish, they'll engage in some courtship behaviors. Uh, we have a picture of the bottom there. Uh, and after uh, courtship, 
sell, uh, and this is similar for, for a lot of our, our shorebirds. Um, we're looking at it in detail here for the least terns though. Uh, they'll, <clears throat> they'll need a nest to lay their eggs. And unlike most birds that you're used to, when you think about nests, you think about them building these elaborate structures um, and trees. The, the nests for beach birds are, are called scrapes. They literally just go over and scrape some sand or shells and make a depression in the sand and, and that's it. And they do a little bit more than that. They'll push their chest up and kind of make it nice and smooth. Um, but uh, it's, it's just a little depression in the, in the beach. And they lay their eggs there and they incubate them, if you want to call it that. They, they protect them. We'll talk about this more later, but it's, uh, it's not keeping them warm as much as keeping them cool. But they'll sit on top of them. Uh, and then you get the chicks, the cute, adorable little fuzzy least turn chick um, in the bottom there. We'll see the least turn chicks, they look like they don't have legs. Uh, and we'll look at Wilson's plover chicks in a minute, and it looks like all they have is legs. Um, <clears throat> but the amazing thing is if you, if you look at the timeline here, the chicks hatch in, in around three weeks, and then within 30 days become flight capable. So you know, they have to go just, just coming out of the egg to being able to fly around in a month. That's a lot of growth, a lot of energy that's needed, a lot of fish that the parents have to bring to feed them. And then they get to hang out on the beach for another month or so, depending on, on, on when they were born. And then they have to migrate hundreds of miles. They have to be strong enough and have enough fat to support um, hours and hours and hours of flight. So. It's really amazing uh, that, you know, you go from eggs to uh, adult-sized birds that have to migrate incredible distances in just a, in a couple months. Some of the adorable scenes you can see out on our beaches. Uh, bring your spotting scope uh, and uh, check out the birds nesting on the beaches and you can see the little chicks being fed when the parents come back. When, when, the, when they're not being fed, you can't see them because they just stay underneath the, the parents the whole time. Once they get bigger, you see them running around. All right, we have uh, black skimmers, another threatened species. You can see on this picture, a uh, good look at their bill. One of the few bird species to have a, a the lower bill is longer than the top bill uh, because of their skimming behavior where they skim across the surface to catch fish. Uh, when you're looking at them from a distance, so it's a black and white bird, uh, as compared to the oyster catcher we'll look at later, which is more upright because it's a shorebird. This is a seabird, so they have more of the horizontal profile. They stand, you know, like gulls and stuff with their body more horizontal. Uh, they don't have any eyes. At least that's the way it looks like when you're looking at them on the beach because the, the eye is up and the, it's black and it's inside of the area with the black feathers. So you don't really wonder, you look at them, you wonder where their eyes are. <clears throat> and if you see them flying uh, over the water, uh, skimming, that's, that's a dead giveaway that it's a skimmer. The young, again, all the young, all the eggs, all the young for all these species are just sandy, speckly, uh, hide in the sand kind of colors. And then they'll quickly grow up. Uh, again, they have to be adult sized and flight capable in a very short period of time. So black skimmers, um, we have uh, the estimate in 2019 was we have around 3,000 pairs nesting throughout the state. You can see the picture of the state of Florida um, and it shows it's kind of color coded for areas where they nest and the darker the red magenta whatever color that is um the darker it is the more birds nest there so you can see up in northeast florida st john's and and uh duval we have <clears throat> some nesting that's occurring uh it's not a ton st john's they were gone for many decades and we just got them back a couple of years ago at anastasia state park uh and then they um, they kind of go back and forth with nesting around Nassau Sound and in some other areas. So it's, we don't have a ton up here in Northeast Florida, but hopefully we treat our habitat right. And um, more importantly, we get people um, allowing them, giving them space to breed 
uh, and nest, they can be a little skittish, the black skimmers. Um, then hopefully we can pull up the numbers here in Northeast Florida. Um, you, you know, I, I guess you could say this is good news, but, um, you know, maybe we'd have more if they did better on rooftops. That's another way of looking at it too, but only about 3%. So they're, they're seabirds. The seabirds are better for rooftops because the, the parents have to go catch the fish and bring them back to the young. Uh, shorebirds don't usually nest on rooftops because, uh, you know, the way shorebirds work is their young are very precocious. They're very capable of, of moving around uh, quickly out of the egg in just, you know, a couple days, you know, as soon as they're born, basically. They have to be able to walk with the parents, go down to the shore, and they learn how to feed on the shore. So uh, we do have some oyster catchers that nest on rooftops. It's a little tricky. Um, but uh, so it's not great if you have to take your young somewhere to feed. Uh, but for, for the seabirds where the young stay put and the parents go get food and bring it back, the rooftops have been uh, something that worked for them. Royal terns, here we go. Here's some pictures with their cool hairdos. Okay, they're birds, they don't have hair, but you know. Um, <clears throat> so these are birds, uh, I think all these are from Huguenot. Um, you can see some, some young ones starting to get their colors down at the bottom, running around in big groups. Uh, Royal tern is not listed by the state um, but all, all of the birds we're talking about, and about 70% of all the birds in the United States, uh, are migratory, they're, they're covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which, super quick side note, um, has had some trouble. You've probably heard about in recent years. Uh, the good news is the current uh, administration is working to, to restore the previous protections of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, the, the main difference was whether or not birds protected by the MBTA were protected from incidental harm or purposeful harm. Uh, so recently regulations went into effect saying that the harm had to be purposeful. Your intent had to be to hurt the bird. If that were the case when the BP Horizon oil spill happened, then none of that money would have gone towards bird conservation and right now, the majority of the work Audubon and FWC is doing throughout the state of Florida to, to help these birds is money that's coming from the oil spill. Uh, so if, if we didn't have the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, operating the way it was at the time, uh, we would have lost, you know, these birds would have suffered, the Gulf Coast populations of these birds suffered a lot, and we, and we wouldn't have been able to, uh, to get funding to help restore them. So hopefully, this year, we'll, we'll get the MBTA back the way it should be. Uh, so royal terns, uh, you see that, the, the cool spikes on the back. They have the black head. They don't have a white forehead like the least terns. They're a much larger bird um, than the least terns also. And if you go to Huguenot and you see 5,000 of a turn, it's, it's the royal tern. Black feet, black legs. <clears throat> Some young, so this is from Huguenot. Um, they they nest up in the dunes and then they come uh, come down to the beach uh, eventually. Um, they come down to keep cool to get um, uh, access to um, shade uh, for a handful of reasons. Um, when the parents are feeding and they come back, the the young just aggregate in these huge collections, creches. Uh, of, of all the young hanging out like a little nursery. Uh, it's beautiful you can get lots of cool pictures. And then you can send them to me with permission to use them in talks. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> all right, the solitary nesting shorebirds. Uh, a little more secretive, the, the colonial nesters, they nest out in the open in huge numbers because it's the strength in numbers kind of approach. If there's 200 least turns and a predator comes, well, 200 least turns will attack that predator and keep it away. Um, so that's kind of their strategy for, you know, being a colony. They're easy to see, but then they can have strength in numbers to respond to, to problems. The shorebirds that are solitary nesters are a little more secretive. They'll nest near vegetation. Um, they'll, uh, they're using that not, not be detected approach. 
Uh, and like I said, the chicks, they're very mobile. They're you know very precocious right after they're born. They, they have to be able to run around and start taking care of themselves. Uh, as far as this affects the way we conserve them, if you've been out to our beaches in the summer where there's nesting taking place, you've probably seen now some pictures shortly, uh, where we post, where we, we put out all these, um, the twine and the signs and posts and let people know this is where birds nest. We can do that for the colonies because it's a big piece of sand and that's where all the birds are. The solitary shorebirds, they just might nest in the dune scattered all along the beach. Uh, so we, we don't, we never know where they're going to be. We can't post it necessarily. Um, uh, so, so it makes it a little more challenging. So here's the beautiful oyster catcher, the tuxedo wearing shorebird. Uh, they have that orangish red bill and then the yellow and orange eye. Uh, a very striking feature to tell them apart from other birds. The bill's uh, very strong, but very thin. They use it to wedge in to oysters and mollusks and eat a lot of mollusks, hence their name, oyster catcher. They'll also eat worms and other stuff too. They have cute little chicks, more nondescript camouflage chicks. This, uh, so they, they nest in the sand um, and on beaches. But in Northeast Florida, the majority, and we have a pretty decent population of nesting oyster catchers, the majority of them nest on shell rakes, we call them, these huge areas along the sides of rivers where you get a bunch of oyster shell washed up. Uh, so this, these are pictures, I think, from the Amelia River up in Nassau. And that's, uh, mm, goodness, one parent. Three chicks, two parents, two chicks. It's a family. That's what that is. That's a family of oyster catchers on a rake. And on the right, that's a bunch of shells, right? Wrong. It's a nest. Can you see the eggs at the bottom of the picture on the right? Uh, so they're doing their job. They're staying camouflaged and being hard to see so predators flying over won't know. Now, most of the time, the parents, at least one parent would be guarding those. Um, uh, occasionally you'll see pictures, usually from staff who are working with these birds uh, of exposed nests. And I just let you know that uh, th these kind of pictures are taken uh, opportunistically. Um, sometimes we have to go and, and do some work and post and, and parents are off nests. We're very careful to minimize any time. I think we were putting up signs um, on this rake to, you know, that people shouldn't go up there and uh, uh, happened, uh, to, you know, the, the, the parents go away. So you quickly snap a picture, finish your work and get out of there so the parents can get back to covering and protecting their nest. Uh, this is an oyster catcher in St. John's County on Julia's Island. And I'm putting this picture in as a plug to remember when you're out looking at any kind of bird, but especially big wading birds and shorebirds, uh, if you notice bands, just, you know, be sure to check for bands. Uh, if you see bands, write down anything you can about them. Like these are red bands with yellow letters. Uh, looks like one on top and a nine below. Uh, so, uh, you know, write down as much as you can about the bands. And then you can go online, you can go onto Google, you can email me, you can get in touch with anybody at Audubon and say, how do I report this band information? And we'll make sure you get sent to the right spot. There's a lot of websites. Sometimes it depends on the species, but if you just Google like oyster catcher band report, um, you can usually find the right site or just contact Audubon. But this provides some great information. Um, the oyster catchers we've had uh, nesting here, we'll get reports of them uh, being down in Central America. And, uh, you know, and then they, they come back and we kind of, you know, know the journey and we know where they're going to winter. Uh, so it's pretty cool. So please, that's how you can help with their conservation by reporting bands when you see them. Uh, so again, lots of cool information on the Florida Shorebird Alliance you can look at about oyster catchers. Uh, one interesting story I'll highlight um, relatively recently. Uh, in Georgia, chicks were observed swimming across 
a river to get to a foraging site when they couldn't fly. So they, you know, before they were really flight capable, but they swam through uh, hundreds and hundreds over 800 feet, I think it says here, uh, to get across the river to eat on some tidal flats. Um, so pretty amazing capabilities uh, that the, the chicks had. We don't have an estimate for oyster catcher populations. So we had for least terns and uh, for other species uh, and for black skimmers, uh, other species, it's FWC is working on that, trying to get enough data, good methods to produce a reliable estimate. Wilson's plover, uh, if you're familiar with plovers, they usually have tiny little bills. So the Wilson's plover, one of its most not notable features is, is the bill that's it's almost the, the size again of its head. Uh, and this one has his head kind of shrunken down a little into his body and looks a little fatter. But if he had his neck stretched up, you'd see the bills uh, about the same width of his head. And that's much different than piping plovers or semi-palmated or other ones. Uh, they've got, if they, they do have the dark, band they'll just have one black band you'll see on these pictures if you're familiar with killdeers that have two black bands the wilson's plover just have one um here's the young you can see they're they're cotton balls on stilts they're absolutely adorable um uh, you can see them along the beach at little talbot anastasia state park if you come down to st john's uh gets a fair number uh they're really adorable we don't have a population estimate for Wilson's plovers, but we know they're, they're not doing great. Um, so this is one of those things where we already have plans, uh, an imperiled species management plan to improve conditions for all the shorebirds I'm talking about. And so rather than have FWC go through additional work to list the Wilson's plover at this minute, uh, at this moment, they're they're just continuing to work on the conservation um, approaches that help the Wilson's plover and, and all the other birds. Um, and, and then over the course of the next couple of years, we'll probably get to the point where we have enough data and, and we might you know, go ahead and have them listed. Um, but as of now, they're not listed by the state. Um, one interesting fact, if you look at this map, for this species, Northeast Florida, very a lot of dark colors uh, up here in Northeast Florida. So we have one third of all the Wilson's plovers that are breeding in Florida are up in Northeast Florida. So that's cool. Timing, uh, pretty much the summer, they nest in the summer. Uh, there's little differences uh, among the species. One thing that's uh, a general difference, again, is between the seabirds and the shorebirds. So these are seabirds. And if you look at the chart, it says uh, it has nest discovery dates and then flightless chick occurrences. So basically, when do we see the nest and when do we see the chicks? The nest, um, well, we don't have snowy plovers. And you got to go to the Gulf Coast if you want to see those. Um, but we have American oyster catcher and Wilson's plover. Oyster catchers in March and sometimes February, the last few years, there's always somebody in February. Uh, Texas had one in January a couple of years ago. But, but by March, we usually have our oyster catchers uh, putting down nests. Wilson's plovers will be late March into early April. Uh, the beginning of April, we'll have chicks from both of those species. So they're very early spring nesting, whereas with the seabirds, we see uh, it's a little bit later. Uh, the least turns one of the earlier ones, but even like, you know, right now in Northeast Florida, we just had the least turns show up. They're doing some um, uh, courtship behavior, but we don't, uh, we don't have any nests. It'll probably be, you know, the end it's, uh, of the, um, you can see it can be early April, but right now, uh, we don't have any. So uh, the, the seabirds in general are, are a month behind, they're a little bit later behind. You see all the chick dates, flightless chick occurrences are mostly the middle of May 
and beyond. Least terns in the er early part of May, but all the other species later than that. So these are more summer, uh, most of the activities occurring over the summer. A lot of these birds, if they fail, though, uh, they'll, they'll re-nest up to two or three times. So we can have nests, and that's why you see these bars extend for a long period of time. If you remember back, they lay the eggs, it's like three weeks and they hatch in 30 days, they're flight capable. So that's a very short time period, but you can see nesting occurs over the whole summer. And that's because they'll have to re-nest. Predator might come and disrupt the colony. They could fail for other reasons. If, if a couple loses their chicks, they'll, they'll retry as long as it's not too late in the season. And then by September, we're pretty much wrapped up. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna go past that. Okay. So the they face problems from loss of habitat. They face um, the usual problems with weather, but that, that I'd say you know they've had to deal with weather there the whole time for thousands of years. They've been dealing with weather and storms. And these birds, they do nest right on the brink. They they nest. They want areas. The colonial nesters need need open sand. So those are areas that get overwashed frequently, but you don't want them to overwash while you have eggs on them. So, so these birds are always nesting in kind of precarious areas, areas that have, are, are prone enough to, to flooding to keep them good habitat, but hopefully you can get a month or two uh, to, to nest and, and produce young and then get out of that spot uh, without any overwash. Um, so they've had to deal with that. Now, you know, climate change and the increased amount of energy and the frequency of storms, um, you know, those could be causing some additional problems too, but uh, definitely the, the development and the loss of habitat and then disturbance and predation are the big concern. Um, <clears throat> a lot of predators, whoa, a lot of predators, uh, feral cats, raccoons, snakes, dogs, coyotes. So some of these are natural. So like the coach whip at the bottom, uh, I see a couple of those every time, not every time, uh, every season. Uh, I go out to Anastasia State Park. That's a normal part of our beach. And and the, the birds are, you know, that's something they've had to deal with. The, the occasional coach whip too. Um, raccoons are native, but there's way too many of them at the beaches. Uh, there's an unusually high number of beach of, of raccoons at the beach because of all the people and the trash and, and garbage. Um, so, so while that's a native species, they're kind of out of balance right now because of the way we use the coast. Um, dogs, coyotes, feral cats, those are all you know new things that have become bigger problems over the years. So we have to do a lot of work to try to manage the impacts of predation. Um, garbage and entanglement is always an issue. I heard Carol talking about a cleanup. Uh, I know a lot of the Audubon societies go out and do cleanups and that's great. Um, it really is sad to, to see these birds caught with garbage. Um, one thing I'll mention quickly. So this is a picture from, from Google Maps of uh, the power lines off Heckscher. So when you drive up a lot of the, the birds, uh, you know, Huguenot Memorial Park, Little Talbot, all the nesting that occurs in, in Duval and Nassau is along Heckscher Drive. And when I would drive up to the field sites up there, you'd see all the fishing lines from the people fishing on the bridge hanging down on the power lines. And, you know, it's always disgusting and you're like driving by and going, oh, somebody needs to do something about this. One time I was driving home and I saw an egret hanging up in the, the fishing line and and that um, unfortunately it took that but that's kind of what motivated me to to then contact JEA. The good news is this happened a couple of years ago so I contacted JEA I got connected with the the right people and um, I you know I asked them about can they move the power lines down to the bridge um, you know they 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 gave some reasons and some DOT reasons and this and that, why that maybe isn't feasible. But they said, but we can go out and clean the lines. And so they scheduled it a couple months later, they went out and cleaned the lines. And then they said, let's just kind of keep an eye on it and see how quickly, you know, these problems come back. Um, it looked pretty good. You know, the, the next year, 
uh, I was out driving around, saw a lot of uh, fishing lines so la last year, and um, I contacted them again at the end of last year. And then when I went up at the beginning of the season, the, the lines were had been cleared again. So uh, yay, J-E-A, for being uh, responsive and going out and doing this clearing. And also it's just a, a, a message to all of us. You know, I drove by so many times saying somebody should do something about that or that's really annoying. Um, and then it really wasn't that much work to, to get JEA to, to help out. So uh, when you see problems like this, you know, raise your voice and try to get in contact with people who can make a difference. And sometimes that difference is made. All right, so the big problem facing the birds is disturbance. And, uh, you know, people do everything out at the beaches. We have driving in our beaches in Northeast Florida. For some reason, we think that's a good idea. Uh, people go out and use the beach, of course, you know, and so there's tons of people all along the beaches. And then, then there can be different vehicles. You see some segways up here. There's all type of uh, uh, kiteboarding and uh, different activities people do around the shorebirds. And some of these activities are not very... Uh, good for the nesting shorebirds. You can see the picture on the lower left has some PVC posts and some flashing and signs. So that's a bird colony behind uh, all these people. Hopefully there's enough space between the posting and where the birds are nesting that uh, the people don't disturb the birds. That's our goal. They don't always have enough room on the beaches, especially with erosion problems at some beaches. Uh, we don't really have enough room to give a big enough buffer for the shorebirds all the time. Uh, it's important to post these areas again because the the eggs and the young are are cryptically colored. They're you know camouflaged. You can't see them very well in these close up pictures. You can see them, but when you're walking around on the beach, it's very easy to to miss them. Uh, so how many birds do you see in this photo? There's a lot, a lot of birds sitting on nests in this photo, but they blend in very well. <clears throat> so disturbance, why is disturbance such a problem? There's a few ways, some are pretty obvious to us, some not so obvious. Uh, we think about incubating young, we think about like keeping you know, chicken eggs, you gotta keep them warm. So you have to get an incubator to keep some warm. Well, these birds are nesting out on the beach. Keeping warm is not a problem. Uh, keeping cool is the problem. So the parents sit on top of the eggs and they sit on top of the chicks to keep them cool uh, out in the, the you know July sun on the beach in Florida. So if people are using the beach and they get too close to the birds and they scare the adults off of the eggs or off of the chicks, now, not only are those eggs and chicks exposed to predators, but they're exposed to sunlight. And, um, you know, very quickly in, in times, uh, you know, unfortunately we know from firsthand experience, <clears throat> a dog got out um, on Disappearing Island down in Volusia <clears throat> a few years back and the birds were gone for like a half an hour that they were kept off of their eggs. Um, but then the whole colony failed. Uh, so, you know, that, that half an hour that the parents were not sitting on their eggs was enough time to cook all of the eggs, basically. The other thing, um, and this is why we had a picture earlier of the little girl and all the birds flushing. People love to, to flush the birds to take pictures. You know, it, it makes very beautiful photos. The problem is when, when you flush the birds and they fly, they're burning calories. They're, they're using up energy. And, that, and that's the thing that's, that, that people don't really understand is these birds are struggling for every calorie. They have to lay eggs. They have to raise young from, you know, from that egg up to full size in you know, a month. They have to put enough energy into that chick to get it to be full size. And, and so the parents have to not only feed themselves, but they have to go and get the fish to feed the young. So they're burning up extra energy. They have to get enough energy into the chicks that they grow and not only grow, but are healthy and then can put on fat. And the parents and the young have to put on a certain amount of fat before they migrate at the end of the summer. So very 
high energy demand, all of this activity. And every time somebody goes through the middle of some birds that just look like they're sitting there chilling out on the beach, because that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, now these birds have to use extra energy. And this happens, if this happens a few extra times a day, uh, you know, over each week, over a month, that's a lot of wasted calories. So giving birds space to just sit and do nothing is, is very important. So how can we make sure that happens? Uh, one of the programs that's a central part of the Florida Shorebird Alliance is our stored, uh, shorebird stewardship or our bird steward program. And that's getting volunteers to, to help us at these nesting sites. And they help with a bunch of activities. In the beginning of the season, it's going out to post. So here you see some, some rope and PVC poles and signs put up around areas that birds are gonna use. So we do that at the beginning of the season. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, oh, so here's some more activity. So we need volunteers to help post and, and get the sites ready. And then uh, throughout the summer, we need volunteers to be out there with the birds uh, to make sure people don't violate the posting. Because surprise, you put up a sign and a string at the beach, and it doesn't really stop people from, from going into these areas. Um, here's a few pretty pictures. <clears throat> These are to help entice volunteers, I think. Uh, this was a couple years ago. We went out to post Julia's Island in the inlet at uh, St. Augustine. Um, went out with FWC. So this is our working conditions for the day out on this island. You can see the fort, Flagler College in the distance. Oh, there's our buddy. Didn't realize I had this picture in there twice. Uh, oyster catchers nest out there, Wilson's plovers nest out there, and least turns, the tiny little bit of dry sand out in the inlet. Uh, you can see when the tide comes up, there's not much that's, that doesn't get covered with water, and yet we've got three different species. Uh, and in, in years past, we've had a, over 100 least turn nests. We've lost a little bit of habitat since then. Um, <clears throat> but so we put up posts, we put out the fencing, uh, the, the the twine and then you have to put the little flashing on it so people can see it because twine in the sun is pretty much invisible. Put up the 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 signs that have the legal messages on them. No dogs allowed. There's a lot of boats that park next to the island with the people run out there. Uh, here's some Wil Wilson's plovers. Uh, and this picture just shows you, you know, it's it's hard for these birds out there. Any bit of shade is welcome by them. And it's so funny to see the signs that we put up. Uh, sometimes you'll walk down the beach and every single sign has a bird sitting in the shadow of the sign trying to keep cool. Uh, so bird stewards are, are volunteers who um, basically hang out at the beach with the birds. Uh, educate and inspire is the are words we use. We, we want people to have positive interactions uh, with beachgoers and let them know about the birds, um, educate them about the birds that are using our beaches. Uh, that's one very valuable thing. An another valuable thing, the beach, the bird stewards are, they're just eyes and ears out on the beach. Uh, you can see when bad things are happening. If people are starting to walk up into the dunes. A, you can try to tell them to stop. B, you can call a park ranger to get them to stop. Um, so having bird stewards out there. And then also people change their behavior when bird stewards are out there. There's a lot of things that people know they shouldn't do, but when there's nobody around, they're not going to get in trouble. They're going to lift up the twine. They're going to try to cut across the beach to get to their car quicker. Uh, but when we have bird stewards out at the beach, people are on a little bit better behavior. We've seen that firsthand over the years. Uh, so if anybody is interested, so some of you might already um, in in the area, so for, for Duval Audubon members, it's usually uh, Huguenot Memorial Park or Little Talbot that are the closest areas. And uh, maybe you've been out there before uh, and that's great. And thank you. If not, uh, please uh, email me and I can connect you with uh, park managers. Uh, we have online training materials. That, uh, there's a, a handful of facts that we can arm you with. We have sheets you can see the steward on the bottoms kind of sharing some pictures. Um, you know, with COVID now, we're um, uh, changing our approach a little bit. We ask stewards to wear masks, keep distance. Um, 
not share binoculars and scopes. One of the great things we, we did in the past was, you know, show them chicks and um, whatnot. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so so it's slightly different under COVID. But uh, um, and of course, we don't only want people who feel comfortable being out on the beach. Uh, you know, the good news is it's outdoors. Um, but if you're interested in stewarding, I can give you a lot more information about that. Uh, and the number one thing is if if stewards are out on the beach and they ever have any problem or any interaction with people that's less than uh, joyous, uh, they can just back off, not interact with that person and call park staff to take care of it. Uh, we have supplies, we have chairs and umbrellas and signs and training and materials. So you have to have absolutely zero information about shorebirds uh, to help out. Uh, we can also use people to help, uh, not as much, and now this has changed with COVID too, but um, surveyors uh, at the nesting sites, most of them by park staff. Uh, occasionally, like at, at Huguenot, um, the park staff would take on a few uh, Audubon member, uh, you know, and some volunteers. Um, we have to check to see how that is because we'd share vehicles, so that might have changed in COVID. But if you're not interested in stewarding, but you want to help out with shorebirds, again, you can contact me and we can find out ways. Uh, if you're a photographer, sending pictures is always a good way. Uh, and so just uh, summarize here, the, the main goal of all of our conservation efforts, Audubon, FWC, and all of our partners, trying to, within 10 years, get the populations of these species up by 10%. Uh, so it's relatively modest goal, but given the challenges we face on the ground, um, we'll take uh, quite a bit of work. Uh, all right, and I'm just gonna close with this cute little picture of what you can see out on our beaches <clears throat> if you go out over the summer. came out to get the fish that I think was longer than the chick's body, somehow swallowed it, and uh, and then right back underneath of its parent uh, in the nest. Uh, some cute little black skimmers at Anastasia State Park a year ago. Okay, all right, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I will, um, I'll, I'll let Carol handle uh, how we want to do this, but I'm, I'm more than welcome to either answer questions now or through email later or whatever y'all want to do. Thanks. Um, so I don't see a lot of questions uh, yet in the chat. Um, there's one from me, actually, and I'll go ahead and ask it. I've always been curious about Julia's Island because uh, it seems like, you know, it's an island that's not very accessible. Or, or do a lot of people stop there? Is it that critical for, you know, stewards yeah. to need to be out there? I was, I've always been curious about that. It is... Um, so yeah, I mean, that's one of the good things about it, being an island out in the inlet, it's not super accessible, so it doesn't get tons of people like, like a Huguenot or exactly. um, Anastasia State Parkwood, but there is a sandbar that has consistently been there for ages, a very flat, it's almost like a football field of just flat sand just to the north of Julia's Island, and so it is a, a boat parking spot. Uh, so the boats, the good news is they all just park, you know, when it gets to lower tide, they come park on the sand right there and they, and they walk around and they hang out and out on the sandbar in the water for the most part. Occasionally though, people would uh, have dogs and the dogs will come up onto the island or the people will come to the island to use it as a bathroom. Um, uh, so, right. <laughs> so uh, the, the good news is it's, it's um, uh, and then there's an, an occasional boater that might come and land on the island, but that's pretty rare. So, so we'll have stewards out there, stewards that, that um, have kayaks. So that's the thing, it's, it's tricky to get to. So, um, but we have FWC staff and Audubon staff that, that do stewarding there. Um, but it, we also have a couple of volunteers that have kayaks. There's a kayak launch point not very far away. It's very short, um, but uh, you basically sit between the island and all the people on the boats and just make sure uh, people don't 
don't move. But um, but it, it's it's funny. It's a small site, but it does like I mentioned before, three different species. Um, sometimes good numbers of least turns if there's enough dry sand. But oyster catchers, which are pretty rare, we always get one or two nests. So it's a very nice site. So Carolyn uh, is asking about how many volunteers are you looking for here in Duval County? A hundred. <laughs> so, um, th there, there is no number of volunteers th that would be too many. Um, th the main thing for that is Huguenot Memorial Park. Huguenot can take people uh, just all, all, all day long. I mean, the tides are a bit of an issue there, but um, Jolie, the, the park service, uh, the park naturalist for the city of Jacksonville, um, she you know, she has a big schedule to fill lots of people. There's, um, there's almost always need. Uh, we try to prioritize with the weekends and the times when the beach is busy, we need the most stewards out. If we fill up those slots, um, then it's nice to be able to get people out on the weekdays. There's not as many people, but there's still a need for stewarding. Um, and um, Amelia Island State Park could use a few more stewards. Um, Little Talbot is a little tricky. Uh, you have to uh, you have to sign up as a park volunteer, and you have to go through their ATV training, and then ATV has to be available. So there's not as many slots um, to steward up there. We do have staff that focus on that because it is difficult. But um, uh, but we have several locations where we could always use more folks. So so for Huguenot though, we would people would reach out to you as opposed to reaching out directly to Jolie, the park naturalist at Huguenot? I mean, you could do either. Either way. It's just, it's, it, it's just, it's easy to remember. People can always reach out to me and then I, I'm the operator. <laughs> I'll, point. I'll uh, connect uh, point. people. It's, it, it's good. I, I, I'll say um, it's selfishly or not or whatever, but it's good if people contact me and come through me um, Say say they want to volunteer, um, and and maybe their schedule doesn't match up good for Huguenot, uh, and maybe we happen to have a least turn nest on Amelia Island. There's there's a couple spots on Amelia Island where sometimes they nest, sometimes they don't on on public beaches, kind of by the Omni. Um, I, basically, I know all the places and all the stewarding that needs to be done. Um, so so that's good. If you contact me, I I can let you know about all the opportunities but you can always reach out to the park itself. Um, Kate is asking if there's any hope. Uh, <laughs> I know yeah. better than this, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because she's asking uh, any hope of keeping cars off of the beaches in Duval and St. John's counties. I mean, is there any motivation or impetus behind any of that at all? Um, so Duval Audubon with... Um, some help from a few staff at, at Florida Audubon, uh, Audubon, Florida back, back in the day before I was up here, um, and some other uh, volunteers, you know, got, you know, helped to get the closure of the North Point at Huguenot Memorial Park. So that was something people said would never, you know, happen, and people in the news treated it like it was going to be the apocalypse, you know. You know what happened? It was so funny. I came in, right, like, that was a pretty new thing. And I was, when I was being uh, given like orientation, I was being told about all the, I, I had to go to my first meeting at Huguenot and they're like, okay, th this person's gonna be there and this person, and these people represent these issues. And this, and, you know, I was, I was being prepared like I was going into battles for like all these people. After it happened and they closed down the beach, that everybody who was arguing and yelling and screaming about it, for the most part, just went into the woodwork. Uh, it's not a huge thing and now it's just kind of the normal thing. So, people, so thank goodness, people adapted quickly. Um, Fort Matanzas had driving and um, red knots plus some other issues um, led the, the National Park Service to close that to driving. So, so we've had a couple, you know, positive movements. Um, funny, it says Daytona's a lost cause. It's funny, they're trying to expand the beach driving and, and when I heard about that, I was like, wait, expand it? How can you go beyond 100% uh, and mandatory for every citizen? Um, but uh, th there's actually a few areas, I guess, where they can't have cars. And they're like, I think, the I forgot what they call it in Volusia, but the, 
the top, the chair basically of their uh, county council is like a big beach driving advocate. So we're trying to keep the protections, we the few protections we have in Volusia right now. St. John's people talk about it every once in a while, um, trying to expand it again. And with all the, the storms and erosion, that's always a problem. When, when people lose the areas they were driving, then they want to find any other like Fort Matanzas. But Fort Matanzas is eroded away. Ugh, we have lots of issues. Erosion is a huge issue that we're, you know, we still really haven't come to grips with, but. Um, Definitely. The good news is we have we have some uh, federally protected endangered species to help us with the fight, uh, beach mice and red knots uh, to, to limit some driving. Um, I'm going to share a comment that Carolyn made uh, just so that everybody can see it. She can only, sorry. So Duval Audubon participated in the Matanzas, Matanzas, Matanzas management plan. Um, something I didn't, I didn't realize. Uh, and enough of the Duval Audubon and the St. John's Audubon people showed up to fight driving on the beach that it didn't come to be in that area, according to, according to what Carolyn's telling me. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, and that's the important thing is we can all work together and right. amplify each other's voices. Amen. And just because we do have these kind of regional names, Duval, Audubon, St. John's Audubon, we have people that, that are in one chapter and would actually prefer to steward or do activities in the other. And that's, of course, always welcome. Amen. Um, so Larry is asking, how often is the stewardship training held? And when can, how can he find out about when training is being held? Um, so the best thing at this point is just to get in, in touch with me and then we'll, we, we will do ad hoc. I'm, I'm right now making our training materials into an online on demand video thing. So we'll see how soon that happens. But okay. we, we do have training, uh, one like meeting at the beginning of each year. Unfortunately, for both St. John's and Duval Audubon, they were in the last week or two. So, so uh Timing's not great on that, but uh, that doesn't matter. We can share the, the PowerPoints. We are going to have an online video. And then we do on the beach training. We just um, uh, have, have people go out with people who've been doing it and see what it's like. So, so we'll take care of training anybody who's interested. Sounds great. Uh, anybody have any other questions for Chris? I don't see any more questions in the chat at this point. No? All right, I think we're good. Chris, thank you so, so much for um, sharing all this information. It was very interesting. I have gotten some really uh, wonderful comments uh, about uh, from some of the attendees uh, ab about this presentation. They're so grateful that you were here with us to e this evening to share the information. Um, I learned a lot about uh, the the numbers, uh, I love those info sheets. I had not ever seen those before. Those are awesome. I'm gonna have to go check those out. So um, I'll, so. I'll uh, remind me and I'll send you the link to them. They're, they're a little hidden <laughs> on the okay. site. Okay, <laughs> yes, please. That sounds awesome. And I can maybe share it on our Facebook page so people can, and our website so people can see it. Well, thank you again, uh, everyone, for, uh, for joining us this evening. And thanks to Chris for an excellent presentation about a very uh, important group of birds that we need to do all we can to protect. Thank right. you. Have, every, have a great evening, everybody. And um, thanks again. Take care. Good night.